I'm high on pot. Hashish, hemp, marijuana, cannabis. Herbs, substance X. It's pot, isn't it? Cannabis has been illegal in this country since 1928. For 75 years, governments have fought to suppress its use and control information about it. Yet, alongside this official policy of prohibition, there's been a steady move towards social acceptance of the drug. The story of how this extraordinary sea change in public opinion came about is the story of how the media came under the influence of the cannabis years. Reefer Madness was an early American propaganda film that deliberately set out to demonize marijuana, a drug which up until then had been considered relatively harmless. Using education as its battle cry, it made sensationalist claims about what befell those who smoked it. Here is an example. A 16-year-old lad apprehended in the act of staging a holdup. 16 years old and a marijuana addict. Here is the most tragic case. Yes. I remember, just a young boy. Under the influence of the drug, he killed his entire family with an axe. In reality, many Americans, especially those in the entertainment industry, knew differently. It was through them that more relaxed information about the drug began to filter out. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very proud to introduce somebody tonight. I want you to come on back to the bar because this is somebody very special. He's the one and only Chico Marx. How we got our names is a very interesting thing. Uh, when we were kids in school, we used to wear a little bag that was around the neck. It was called a grouch bag. In this bag, we would keep our pennies, our marbles, a piece of candy, little marijuana, whatever we could pick up. <laughs> what well, we were studying to be musicians. Interviewed by Malcolm Muggeridge and a young Jonathan Miller on the arts program Monitor, writer Norman Mailer discussed using marijuana as a writing aid. The business of, of running on drugs, sometimes you write as though you were definitely, I mean, drugs were the sort of motive power when you were writing. No, I've never written on drugs. I've edited on drugs. Never written on drugs. It's when you were doing that that uh, weekly in uh, Greenwich Village. Well, what I would do is I would write the thing. Uh, uh, let me put, let me shift that. I, I probably I'm certain I've written paragraphs and pages here and there when I've been on drugs, or, or at least when I've been so ridden with drugs, even if I weren't taking them, I was my system was full of them. You see, but generally speaking, I've done practically all my writing without drugs. But I have done things like edit when I'm dead drunk. You see, or or, or on marijuana, and then of course I always go through it afterward go back over it. I always finish off something sober because, you know, when all said, I, I, it seems to me that, you know, when everything else goes wrong in your life, the one thing you've got to hold on to is the respect for your craft. You know, it's, it's no way to become a writer to, 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 to take the drugs. One takes the drugs for other reasons. I mean, I'll put it this way, I'd rather take marijuana than take penicillin. To me, you have a view that uh, these things like penicillin and the modern drugs are in fact part of the plague, part mm. of the arm mm. of the armaments, the devil, don't you? Yeah. I cordially agree. Mm. But you as a Small cliques of intellectuals were by no means representative of the public at large. But cannabis was beginning to make an appearance in youth circles and among those looking for something different. It was almost the first really uh, serious countercultural illegal substance that people discovered in the years after the Second World War. It grew in popularity through the 50s. Um, you had the, the beginnings of a kind of folk club scene, you had sort of coffee bars and, and all these kinds of adolescent teenage youth culture when you you began to get the beginnings of more of a sort of music culture in this country jazz in particular I was part of a movement called the Revivalist Jazz Movement uh, during the late 40s and 50s. And we were all very puritanical about drugs. This was because we were very much against the modernists who played bebop in the style of Charlie Parker and so on. And we thought, and we knew, and we were right, that they all smoked a lot of dope. Seemed about a reaper five feet long Mighty men, but not too strong you be high, but not for long. If you a viper, 
The funny thing was, though we were playing all these old tunes from the 20s, King Oliver, Jelly Roll Morton, Louis Armstrong, so on, uh, and wagging our fingers at how naughty it was to smoke dope. And in fact, uh, the early jazz people smoked it a lot. The great blues singer Bessie Smith uh, did. And when her niece was being uh, interviewed by Michael Albertson, who wrote a book about Bessie, uh, he said to uh, the niece, uh, tell me, uh, did Bessie smoke shit? And uh, the niece said, oh, no, just regular reefers. You know, there was sort of misunderstanding. At the end of the 50s, cannabis was still mainly to be found in the jazz joints and bohemian back streets of London. But outside the capital, pockets of bohemianism were emerging in big dock cities like Liverpool and Bristol. It was through these that the traffic of the world flowed. How does it get here to Bristol? Uh, through the ports, such as the Pool of London, Bristol and uh, Liverpool and so on, and then it's distributed throughout the country. And who circulates it then? Uh, well, I think there's a, a large number of people, mainly coloured men, uh, or and a few white people that uh, are mixed up in this. Clubs like this catered for a new immigrant population and were places where black and white cultures mixed freely. I guess it can't be denied that a lot of white people became introduced to weed through black culture. I, I don't think anyone could deny that. But it wasn't forced on anybody. You know, we didn't come and stick joints in your face. You came and took the shit. As the 50s became the 60s, cannabis moved on from the haunts of beatniks and sailors and into the living rooms of the middle classes. Let's face it, the English aren't known for sort of being freed up, you know what I mean? There's a whole stiff upper lip thing. And I think, along with the influx of different cultures, music, and copious amounts of weed, the English have definitely got a lot looser. This programme was made by director John Borman for the new BBC Two channel. It was the first time that casual reefer smoking had been shown on television. Can I have this? There's a big story attached to this, you see. In Guyana, the maidens go out at midnight. Naked. Quit theatering, Dad. <laughs> Just roll, will yeah. Fourteen-year-old maiden. You're dropping it. Who is bird. making with the fire, like the matches? In 1966, news cameras filmed a group of publicans being shown various forms of cannabis and smoking paraphernalia by the local police. Most of them clearly had never seen or smelt the drug before. Even the effects needed explaining. Uh, well, it makes them high. This is the expression that's usually used. Uh, it makes them feel very good, forget all their cares and worries, and uh, sends them up.